Okay, this uh, next question is the analysis of the real property um, from a question from the February 2004 bar. This question is largely about covenants running with the land. It's got a little bit of other law in there, a little bit on servitudes, but uh, there are better questions uh, that deal in depth with both servitudes and covenants. This one is just a covenants problem, probably, mostly. Um, and it is, deals with the covenants in the setting where you have the landlord-tenant relationships. This can happen in a couple of settings. One is where you have a developer who has developed lots of uh, uh, structures here, or houses, and then sells them to individual people and their promises that go back and forth. And that's one setting in which this problem of covenants running with the land and equitable servitudes uh, is where that comes up. And the other place where it comes up is in the landlord-tenant situation. And this problem is in the landlord-tenant situation. Now, in the landlord-tenant situation, when we're going to deal with covenants uh, or servitudes, the, uh, uh, the, one of the key things that we have to uh, be clear on from the beginning is that in the landlord-tenant situation, there are two legal relationships between them. There's a contract relationship between them, and there is a property, a real property relationship. The landlord owns a black acre and leases it to tenant, and, um, the, and the tenant promises to pay money in exchange for the use of black acre. Well, that's a contract. And so those people can enforce the promises they made to each other on pure contract theory if they want to. Secondly, if the uh, landlord owns the land and conveys an interest in the land, if they convey an easement to someone, they convey a, uh, one of the common law tenancies to someone, such as you know, lease and anything like that sort. They convey the oil and gas rights to someone, uh, covenants to people. So the landlord can, can convey an interest in the estate, uh, uh, whatever interest he or she may wish to convey. They can convey that to someone if you do. If I convey someone the fee simple, then I'm out of the picture. And of course, they own Blackacre. But if I convey them something like an easement, now we're both in the picture. Okay? And it's that situation where we're both in the picture where there are problems about our relationship. What duties do I owe you, and what duties do you owe me? Uh, now, in the landlord-tenant situation, we have exactly that problem. Someone is the landlord and they lease property to someone. And when they lease the property, that's a contractual arrangement for one thing. But it also, there is a property arrangement between us, just like if I own Black Acre and you have an easement across Black Acre, we have a property relationship with each other. There's some rules about property that apply to our relationship. And if I convey to you a tenancy, uh, for years, or a, tenant, or a periodic tenancy, any of the four tenancies, where I convey any kind of a right to occupy to you, but I'm, I'm still on the reversion, then we have a land, we have a real property relationship, just as if I gave you an easement, we would have a real property relationship. And so in that, so in that uh, easement, if I gave you an easement, there are rights that you can enforce against me and rights that I can enforce against you. If I convey a uh, uh, a lease to you, one of the four tenancies, or uh, we can, there are, most of them are just plain leases nowadays, but if I convey a tenancy, one of the four recognized tenancies that the common law has, if I convey one of those tenancies to you, you have the right to occupy pursuant to the terms of that tenancy, and I have the reversion, so we have a property relationship. And um, there are things you can enforce against me because of the property relationship, things I can enforce against you. Uh, in uh, the landlord-tenant situation, we, uh, it's important, the way these park questions are almost always constructed, uh, what happens is that uh, 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 I, if I'm the landlord and let's say you are the tenant, that uh, you can sue me and I can sue you on the contract but I can, we can also sue each other on real property theories. And these problems on the bar exam are constructed <coughs> in such a way that uh, you need to tell them that 
the person can enforce their rights under either of these theories, or maybe they can't enforce their rights under either of them, or maybe the person can enforce their rights under one theory but not the other. So the bar examiners are really testing to see if you understand that these two legal relationships are going on and that you can, you can litigate pursuant to either one of them. Uh, in a landlord-tenant situation, if I uh, uh, convey uh, a black acre to you, convey a, a, a lease for, say, five years, well, that's a term of years, to use the common law language. But this term of years also has some promises that you have made to me. Uh, and this, the promises that I've made to you and promises you've made to me, during this five-year period, you're supposed to pay me rent. Maybe I'm supposed to maintain the place. Um, the, uh, I, I certainly promise you quiet enjoyment. Quiet enjoyment meaning your right to use it. Nobody else is going to come and take it away from you. I promise you quiet enjoyment for the five years that you have leased the property. Um, the, there may be other promises that we've made. And so this lease is a combination of my doing two things. One is conveying an interest in Blackacre to you, so you now have the right to occupy. That's the interest I conveyed. And there are a bunch of promises that you and I have made to each other. The, uh, the, uh, and so it's those promises that we are concerned about, which ones uh, can be enforced under which doctrines. And the basic problem, basic answer is that essentially all those promises can be enforced under either contract or uh, certainly under contract law. All of the promises can be enforced. But if I'm the landlord and you're the tenant and you assign to somebody, call them A, the assignee, you assign to an, an assignee and um, the, the, just because you conveyed your real property rights doesn't mean that you dealt with the contract. You and I have a contract. And you, if you have the right to occupy for five years, three years into that five-year period, if you decide to convey your right to occupy to somebody else, well, you can do that if you want to. You convey them to someone else. But you and I have a contractual arrangement that still exists separate from that. So if this other person doesn't pay the rent for the next two years, I can collect the rent from you on a real property theory, pardon me, on a contract theory, just by enforcing the contract, even though you're not occupying the land anymore. So I can, even after you, after three years, you conveyed the land to uh, uh, a signee for the next two years, uh, and if that assignee doesn't pay the rent, I can collect the rent from you by enforcing the contract between us because we're still in privity of contract. On the other hand, if I want to collect the rent from your assignee, okay, I do not have a contractual arrangement with your assignee. Now, if your assignee, when you conveyed your ownership in the real property to this person, if that person said to you, I promise you I will pay Emerson the rent, okay, now I'm the third party beneficiary of that promise and I could very well enforce that against the, uh, the assignee. So I could collect from the assignee on a contract theory if the assignee made some contract promises. But if they didn't, if, if they didn't do that, then I really cannot enforce any contract rights against the assignee. Whereas the estate which you own, the uh, 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 the estate which you own is, uh, let's start with me, the estate that I own is, uh, I own Blackacre. And now I can convey Blackacre to you, and you know, because I have a right to carve up my estate that way, I want to and give you a term of years out of my estate. Now, uh, when you have this term of years, you, uh, in, in our lease, you also made some promises to me. Let's say you promised me you'd pay the rent, and you promised me uh, that you would maintain the property. Well, those promises, certain promises that, that you're making me now, those promises which touch and concern the land, and it's a little vague as to exactly what that means, but the promises which are connected enough to the land itself. For example, you promised to maintain the the, the exterior of the building. 
promises which are connected enough to the use of the land, uh, those are viewed, uh, they t we say they touch and concern the land, and those promises become a part of the estate which you have. In other words, the estate which you have is a tenancy for years, but you have a tenancy for years subject to a bunch of promises that you made to me. So it's like there's a hole in your estate, so to speak. Your estate now consists of not only do you have certain rights, but you also have certain duties. It goes with your estate. And so, uh, uh, the, uh, so the estate which you own is the right to occupy subject to those, those promises which touch and concern the land. And so this means that if you uh, want to convey all the estate that you own to the assignee, I'm the landlord, you're the tenant, and you made me some promises which touch and concern the land. So now, if you want to convey your estate to some assignee, when you convey your estate to the assignee, the assignee automatically gets all those promises that you made. They had, uh, well, not quite automatically, they have to have notice of them to know about them. But if they touch and concern the land, and if at the time that you and I made our arrangements, if we intended for the promises that you make to me, if we intended for those to be passed on with the estate, then those promises sort of become a part of the estate, like there's a hole in the estate, so to speak. And when you convey your estate to the assignee, you convey it to the assignee, and the assignee gets your estate with those holes in it, with those promises. And if, the, if we meet the right conditions, the assignee is burdened with those promises. And the conditions are that the assignee will be burdened with these promises if, number one, when we made the promises, we intended for them to be passed on with the, with the estate. Number two, these promises touch and concern the land. You can see why that's necessary. And finally, that the person, well, the, the person who you are conveying it to, uh, uh, that person had notice of, the, if it's a burden, that person had notice. Now, uh, the, the, an interesting thing here is that uh, it, when you made the promises to me, I was conveying an estate to you. I was conveying a leasehold to you and the leasehold I was conveying, say, for five years, I was conveying that estate to you, and at the time of that conveyance, you made these promises back to me so that the estate which you get is the, uh, the right to occupy for five years, but with these holes and promises that you made to me. And that's the estate that you actually own. Now, you need to distinguish between the case, that case, in the case where you and I are just next door neighbors and we don't own an interest in each other's land at all. And now we come out and I promise you I won't build above three stories and you promise me that uh, you'll uh, you know, do something, you won't build above three stories either or something. And so we make promises to each other, even, we don't need them both, just I make promises to you or you make promises to me. And let's suppose we write these promises down. And, uh, but even though we make the promises and write them down, do you see we were not exchanging an estate in land at the time that the promise was made? Uh, at the time that the promise was made, we were not exchanging an estate in land. You were simply, I just promised you that I would maintain the fence or not build above three stories or whatever it is. So I made these promises, but not in the course of an exchanging land. And so even though, uh, let's say you promised me some things, even though you made those promises, those promises are not a part of your estate. Okay? They're just some separate promises that you made to me. But if, the, if, you, if you were conveying an estate, if I was conveying an estate to you, and you made those promises as a part of that transaction, now it's different because the concept is that the estate which you have has those promises built into it. Whereas when we just, we did, we were not, when we just made the promise across the fence that I wouldn't build above five stories, that that really is not, uh, does not make 
we were not in privy of a state with each other when that promise was made. And that promise doesn't really attach to the estate in the same way. And so we say that uh, if I was conveying an estate to you when this happened, uh, we owned an interest in each other's land somehow, then the promises uh, that touch and concern the land become a part of the estate. But uh, uh, if it's just a separate promise we made over the backyard fence, then the promise is not a part of the estate. So you can see how the horizontal and vertical privity issues come up. The horizontal privity is saying, at the time that if I'm conveying to you, I'm the landlord and you're the tenant, you're conveying, I'm conveying to you five years and you're making certain promises back to me. You promise to pay the rent, you promise to maintain the exterior of the building, you promise to pay the taxes. Okay, and so if that's made in conjunction with this transfer, so the estate that you have, like I say, it in, includes those promises. Uh, and when you pass on the estate, those promises go with the estate if you meet the requirements. Now, uh, and so when we talk about the people who made the promise being in privity of estate with each other, that's what we're talking about, that at the time that you made the promise to me, it was part of an estate uh, transaction of some sort, so it becomes a part of your estate. Now, um, and so that's what we mean by horizontal privity. Whereas if people just make the promise to each other over the backyard fence, and it's not part of a real estate transaction, they just make these promises, I promised I won't build above three stories or something, but they're not transferring an estate or anything, then uh, these people, uh, those promises were not made as a part of an estate transfer. And we say they did, the people who made the promises did not have horizontal privity. And if you don't have a horizontal privity, the burden of the covenant will not run with the land uh, without horizontal privity. Because the idea is that if, um, uh, when, if you have an estate in land, and uh, if your estate includes the promises that you made to me, okay, and now if your estate is transferred to someone else, they get the estate with those promises as a part of it. Now, uh, the, uh, but if you made me a promise that you would maintain the exterior or something of that sort, and you made those promises when it was not part of a land transaction, you just made those promises, those promises are not a part of your estate. And so when the estate itself gets passed on to the successive owner, that promise isn't, isn't a part of the estate. And so the burden doesn't run because the estate did not include that promise. And so that's why if you don't have horizontal privity, the burden will not run with the land. Uh, some jurisdictions say uh, that the burden won't run unless, the unless both the burden and the benefit uh, were uh, touch and concern the land. And uh, I will talk more about that in just a minute. So anyway, you understand the idea of vertical, of horizontal privity. And vertical privity, of course, is that if you, the tenant, made a promise that you would, you would convey, that you would pay rent and do these other things, if you made those promises, and if, um, the, uh, if when you pass on the estate to the next person, you pass the whole estate to them, that's the vertical privity because you, you had the estate and you passed all the estate that you had on to this next person. Uh, you can see how if you uh, have the burden of a covenant and you, you uh, let's say you, you've, and you, you don't pass all of your estate, well, if you didn't pass all the estate, the new person is not really in privity of estate with, uh, and it's just, uh, it doesn't run. You gotta pass the, the, the conceptual reasons I leave alone, uh, but it just doesn't run. You can see that if you, if you have the burden uh, of a covenant and uh, when you convey the estate, you don't convey the entire state, then the burdens don't run. Now, uh, so uh, the um, looking at this problem, then with all that background, we can wrap up this problem pretty quickly. 
here glory glory conveyed to Tony for five years and then four years into the lease Tony assigned to Anne. There are some promises here. Lori promised, uh, had a non-competition clause. She will not lease to other people in the shopping center, will, will not lease another store uh, for selling uh, stationary items. Now, I noticed that what, she re what it really says is that the landlord will not allow any other gift or greeting card store in the center. Uh, and so that's a problem. It's going to become a problem because uh, if you allow Safeway in there, where Safeway is not a greeting card store, but they do sell greeting cards, you might allow a drugstore there that might just have a stand where they sell a few greeting cards. And so if what is this promise from Lori to Tony that I will not have another greeting card store there? Do they intend there won't be anybody else there who sells greeting cards, but not just they're not one who primarily sells greeting cards? So the promise, it isn't real clear what promise Lori is making, because the words are not as clear as they could be. In any event, Lori promised Tony uh, this non-competition clause that we're talking about. And Tony promised Lori some things also. What Tony said is that uh, Tony has a right to re renew the lease. Okay, and this is, this is considered a right which touches and concerns the land. A right to renew the lease and also that he will operate a gift shop only. That's the only thing that Tony is permitted to do with this store space is to operate a gift, the gift shop but he has a right to renew it. So he has the benefit of this and uh, the, and the burden of this one. This, this is a, the right to renew, of course, is a benefit. And the, uh, to, the limitation of the use is a burden. So the question becomes uh, when Tony uh, Tony conveys to Ann, and when Tony conveys to Ann, do these benefits and burdens run to Ann? Well, the, uh, this one will, because the right to renew touches and concerns the parties, because the, the lease said that the parties intended for the covenant to run. It, um, A line, the, it says in the second paragraph, landlord and tenant agree for themselves and their successes and assigns. So the intent for the, uh, these covenants to run is clear, and you need intent for them to run. Secondly, touch and concern, uh, these, uh, both of these touch and concern the land. This one touches and concerns the land, uh, the right to renew. Uh, touches and concerns the land uh, j just because it's uh, it, the history of it is. This is where the case law has come down. These touch and concern the land. This one, the way in which the land is going to be used, that's a burden. Does that touch and concern the land? And uh, this, this commercial limitation on use, if I lease a store to you and I say, uh, you cannot sell petroleum products in your store. Okay, does that really touch and concern the land, or is that just telling you how to run your business? I mean, uh, if I say you can rent this, you can rent this place, but you can't have children there. I'm forgetting about the fact that it's illegal. But if I rent the place and say you can't have children there, is that really got anything to do with the land itself? If I rent you a grocery store. And I say, in this grocery store, you can't sell uh, apples. Does that really have anything to do with the land? Whereas if I rent you the store and I say, you got to get off in one year, if I say, you got to pay me rent to stay there, I say, you got to repair the building, okay, that touches and concerns the land. But what kind of food you sell there, probably, you know, does it or doesn't it? And, you know, it doesn't really touch and concern the land. But the reason it's treated as though it does in a lot of situations is because uh, 
it has a commercial benefit and things that people want to do because they have a commercial benefit, the legal system wants to allow that. And so if I have a shopping center and I lease you a shoe store in the shopping center, and if I promise you there won't be any other shoe stores in the shopping center, well, that has a commercial benefit because I can get a little bit more money from you for rent if you know there won't be any competition in the shopping center. And secondly, uh, you're willing to pay a little bit more because you, there won't be any local competition. And so there's a commercial advantage to these non-competition clauses. And because of that, the, most systems, uh, the legal system wants to figure out a way to let people do this. And, but um, some jurisdictions say that the, these commercial enhancement leases do touch and concern the land, and therefore they will run. Uh, and some say they do not touch and concern the land. And what happens here is that the restatement takes a position. The restatement, restatement says that these touch and concern the land at uh, in equity, but they're not touch and concern in law. What does this mean? This means that if you sue for equitable relief, uh, they, if you sue for an equitable relief, the, the servitude will run because uh, they touch and concern so far as the equity courts are concerned. But so far as the law courts are concerned, these commercial enhancement leases do not touch and concern. That's a restatement position. Now, we care about that because whether or not, uh, let's see, uh, he's going to operate this only. Actually, we don't really care that much about it because uh, there's no one challenging that. But here's the, the uh, rights. We've got a chance to talk about it anyway. But the right to renew is a benefit, and this does touch and concern the land. It's just a matter of law. This does touch and concern us. That's a yes. OK, so let's go back to what we have. Lori is leasing to Tony for five years. And Tony promised, Tony says, I have a right to renew. And he has a burden. He will operate as a, uh, as a gift shop only. On the other side, over here, Lori also made some promises, promised not to lease competing store space. Now, uh, Tony conveys to Ann. Tony assigns all of his interest to Ann. And so the question is, does Ann get the benefits and burdens? And so first, do the burden of these covenants run with the land? Well, the, uh, oh, by the way, we, there's one covenant we didn't put here. Tony obviously promised to pay rent, didn't he? And this certainly touches and concerns the land. The burden of the covenant to pay rent always runs with the land. You don't have to do any fancy analysis. It does. So here's Tony, who's conveyed to Ann. Uh, does Ann have the burden to pay rent? Yes. She has the burden to pay the rent. The burden of the covenant to pay rent always runs, runs with the land. Um, and uh, this was an assignment. Uh, this was not a sublease. And since this is an assignment, Ann has all of the estate that Tony used to have. And whatever burdens come with this estate, they will run with the land if she had notice. With regard to paying rent, that will run even if she didn't have notice. Secondly, the right to renew, that's a benefit. In order for the benefit to run with the land, it needs to touch and concern the land. They need to intend for it to run. And we have all that. And that's all that's necessary. So this benefit will run. So Ann has a right to renew. How about, does Ann have a right to do anything besides operate a gift shop? And the answer is, uh, we weren't asked. Okay, um, And so we don't really have to deal with that. Over here is where that issue comes up, because Lori signed a non-competition clause. And here, her non-competition clause says that she will not lease the store to someone who competes with Tony, and, or competes with Ann now. So this is a burden which Lori has. And the question really becomes, does this burden run with the land? Well, Lori has this burden. And to decide whether or not this burden is going to run, 
We ask question number one, did the parties in, intend? Yes, they intended for it to run because they said so right there in their lease. It's for the heir, successes, and signs. So they intended for this non-competition clause to run. Secondly, uh, does this touch and concern the land? Well, a non-competition -comp clause touches and, con and the restatement position is that it touches and concerns at law but not in equity. In equity but not in law. If it's, that means that if these people sue for money damages, they won't be able to get them. So if Lori is, tries to, pardon me, if Ann is going to sue uh, Lori, um, actually, Lori never sold to anybody. So this, this doesn't have to run. I take that back. I'm sorry. Yeah, Lori did not sell. So Lori never sold. This, this, this covenant here doesn't have to run to anybody. Okay. The only thing we have to have is to have the benefit of it to run to Anne, because the burden doesn't have to go any place. It started with our Lori, and she's still there. So uh, does the benefit of this uh, covenant run to Anne? And the benefit of this covenant is the benefit of, uh, so the other covenant that these people have the benefit of here is that is the the landlord will not uh, basically will not compete. Now this is obviously a benefit uh, to Tony. So this is a benefit to Tony that the landlord will not compete, and it's a burden to Laurie. But this burden doesn't need to run any place because she didn't convey to anybody. But the benefit, Tony started out with a benefit, and if Anne wants to sue Laurie, then the question is, did this benefit run to Anne? And uh, in order for the benefit to run, the, uh, some jurisdictions say the burden must touch and concern the land. So, in order, once again, in order for the benefit to run, some jurisdictions say the burden must touch and concern the land. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, does this burden touch and concern the land? Well, in equity, it does. In law, the restatement says it does not. And so if Anne sues in equity, she can get an injunction against what Lori is doing, but she cannot get damages against Lori. So uh, with all that in mind, we can pretty much answer the questions now. The questions, you know the facts of the problem. And so the first question is, is Anne entitled to renew the lease? And whether or not Anne is entitled to renew the lease depends on whether the benefit of this covenant ran with the land to Anne, and uh, it, it does, uh, this, uh, this benefit will run, it touches and concerns the land. Uh, these people even had horizontal privity. You don't have to, usually don't have to have it for the benefit to run. They even had the horizontal privity. The burden didn't need to run any place. So yes, this is enforceable. And for answer to the first question, is Anne entitled to renew the lease? Yes, because the benefit will run. Is Lori entitled to pass due percentage rent? Lori wants to get the pass due percentage rent. She wants to get it from Tony or from Anne. If she wants to get it from Tony, she'll have to get it on a contract theory because Lori and Tony are no longer in privity of estate. If Lori wants to get it from Anne, she will probably have to get it on a real property theory because um, uh, it does, doesn't look like Anne made any promises to Tony. If Anne made promises about paying rent or something to Tony, Lori would be the third party beneficiary. But if Anne did not make any such promise to Tony, then the only way Anne, Lori can collect from Anne is on a real property theory, not a contract theory. And so the first part of the question is, 
Is Lori entitled to pass through percentage rent from Ann? Lori from Ann. And uh, the answer is that Ann will defend saying that you, Ann will say that Lori, you, uh, that I have the benefit of a covenant, and she proved that. Ann says, I have the benefit of the covenant not, that you promised not to compete, and I claim that you violated that covenant by leasing to people who are selling uh, stationary items, gift items in their store. It's just, it's just a little rack, but still you promised not to do it. And what happened is that Lori promised not to rent to another store. It says uh, the landlord will not allow any other gift or greeting card store, gift or greeting card store. And Lori said, I didn't rent to a store. So the question is, what did they really mean? Do they really mean store, or don't let anybody rent this stuff at all? Uh, it's, and don't, it don't sell them at all. And so this is a question of interpretation of what they meant. And Lori technically did not rent a greeting card store to anyone else. And so on, just on the words, it looks like Lori wins. But Anne will argue that the intent was for no one to sell there at all. The, uh, secondly, can Lori collect the rent from Tony? If she collects from Tony, it has to be on a contract. Oh, by the way, if Anne, let's back up. If Lori has uh, violated the covenant, then Anne has remedies, okay? But if Lori has violated the covenant, her remedy is going to be to enjoin Lori because uh, the, uh, the, um, these uh, covenants not to compete, they touch a concern in equity but not in law. And so Anne can bring an equitable claim to stop Lori get an injunction, but apparently no damages. Now, and then finally, I can, and so when Lori tries to collect rent from Ann, <coughs> Ann will say, uh, Ann will say, uh, uh, yes, you can collect the rent on a real property theory, but not a contract theory. But then Ann will say, I'm entitled to damages for your violating this covenant. So Ann will, so Lori can get rent but Anne wants damages for her violating the covenant. And if we're in a jurisdiction where the uh, uh, covenant's not to compete, touch and concern at law, then Anne can sue for law damages. But if you're in a jurisdiction where the covenant not to compete does not touch and concern at law, only in equity, then Anne cannot get money damages. And there's a split of authority as to whether or not covenants not to compete to the touching concern at law or equity, split of authority, and restatement says what I just told you. Uh, finally, if Lori wants to sue Tony, if Lori wants to sue Tony, she will have to uh, uh, sue Tony on a contract theory. Tony is still liable on a contract theory for the rent as it was promised to Lori. And, uh, and so yes, she can collect the missing rent from Tony. But even if she collects, tries to collect the missing rent from Tony, Tony is uh, going to say that, uh, Lori, you violated the, the promise not to compete. So Tony will use that same promise also as a defense. Um, as to when Tony brings this action defending, uh, I, don't, I don't think the uh, the running of the covenant doesn't, we're not, it's under contract law now. So we're not dealing with running of covenants. So Tony should be able to use uh, the defense that Lori, you breached the covenant as a, to offset money damages in all jurisdictions because Tony is not relying on real property theories, he's relying on contract theories. Okay. Uh, the, um, that is the end of this question from the February 04 bar exam.